You are listening to a podcast of the Geek IO Media Network. You are listening to a podcast of the Geek IO Media Network. For all of our shows and more, visit geek-io.net and to help support the network, head over to patreon.com/geekio. Hello, gentle listener. While Geek IO holds its talent to the highest standard, what follows will likely involve the sort of language usually reserved for sailors on leave. If you're of a delicate disposition, then perhaps you would consider a different podcast. Now for a lesson. Konbanwa, Anime Attacker Show a Yokoso. Good evening. Welcome to the Anime Attacker Show. You may have heard these words before, but I'll teach you what they really mean. Remember, we will be discussing all episodes up to the ones we talk about tonight. Anata go supporter o Kenishi Nanara Soyo. If you don't mind spoilers, welcome. Go beyond! Plus! Glory to the Hypnoto. Hi! Konbanwa Minasan, this is the Anime Otaku Show episode number 41. And surprise, I am your host, Josh, me, my other self, and not Irene McGrath. And joining me in the magical worlds of anime are tonight, one night only, Carrie. I'm floundering terribly on a nickname, Wilcox. And that's it. Just us. Two is the loneliest number. And, uh, oh yeah, CJ's here doing the chair thing. Hi, CJ. Hello. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. A little bit of a different roster tonight from usual, as you may have noticed, uh, but we're still going to do our thing. And speaking of doing our thing, what might tonight's shows be? Tonight we are going over Demon Slayer, Kimetsu no Yaiba, Season 1, Episode 5, My Own Steel, and Season 1, Episode 6, Swordsman Up Accompanying a Demon. Also doing Fruits Basket Season 1, Episode 5, I've Been Fooling Myself, and Season 1, Episode 6, Perhaps We Should Invite Ourselves Over. And that uh, One Punch Man Season 2, Episode 4, The Metal Bat, and Episode 5, The Martial Arts Tournament, from their weird-ass fucking numbering schemes that Hulu does. Um, Also, for this week, we are trying out Senko the Helpful Fox Season 1, Episode 1 through 3. I'm going to pamper him to his heart content. Don't be shy now, and as long as you're happy. Indeed. And before we get into any of this stuff, for you podcast listeners, we're going to have a brief break for a few advertisements from the people who put money on our pockets. I mean, our lovely sponsors. See you in a few. And welcome back. Remember, you can support the stream in everything we do over at patreon.com to geek io to get that ad free master feed so uh carrie ladies choice do you want to just go straight down the list or you want to start with something specific tonight uh let's go straight down the list because i feel like we've got some shit to talk about with that top on that uh that list topper there i promise i can speak tonight oh you mean that demon slayer kimetsu no yaiba oh yes this is definitely this is our star of the season, you guys. I thought it was going to be One Punch Man, and then Justin did the whole Bill Wirtz, try it! And that is, I, yeah, just, you need to watch this show. I don't know why you're listening to us if you still haven't watched it, but you need to go watch this show. It's real good. So in season one, episode five, My Own Steel, we get to see the fallout from uh the final selection tanjiro finally makes it through along with what was it four other people four other people out of the what dozens who were sent i think it was something like 16 but still yeah that's still a quarter of the people who were sent and only one of them that we know of fell to the big guy before tanjiro took it out which means the rest of them either fell to random ass demons or escaped through the Wisteria forest and were never seen again. Would hope that it's the latter, but knowing this show, it is probably the former. Probably the former. Hey man, demons gotta eat. Just so happens that people are delicious. You would know this how? Um. <laughs> Moving on. Indeed. So yeah, uh, Tanjiro finally makes it through seven days in a forest with a bunch of 
demons who are out to get him and constantly strengthening themselves by eating his test mates. And he makes it out and gets the rundown on what's going to happen next. Here's your rank. We're going to give you your uniforms. And one guy in particular is real damn eager to get his hands on that sword. Surprise! You don't get a sword right off the bat. No, 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 no. First, you got to pick a rock. Yep, you get your sword. You got to pick the ore for it, and they don't tell you shit about how to pick it. They just hand you a bunch of rocks and say, here you go, grab one. But of course, Tanjiro, being Tanjiro, uses his nose to sniff out the best rock. And so there's going to be something special with that, I'm pretty sure. Where it'll turn out that he has the best of the swords because he was able to pick the best ore or whatever. But either way, he picks the one that called to, that called to him, and that's the important part. And yeah, they also uh, they also get crows. Yes, I'm sad. Like, so he got assigned his crow, and then they immediately just flew off, and you hardly ever see them at all. But Except that's... for uh, Lightning Blonde Boy, who got a sparrow. Apparently, <laughs> it was so cute. I love his little sparrow. And uh, Sasuke, not Sasuke, Scarface is was real damn pissed about that bird. Look, man, crows killed his parents. I thought demons killed his parents, probably. Demons, crows, older brother, you know. Demon crows. Those, those Sasuke types. And that's, I bet you that's exactly what he is, is he's a Sasuke type. Although personality-wise, he's a lot more Bakugo. Eh, more like if Bakugo and Sasuke did the fusion dance, because he's definitely got the whole dead family angst going on. But he's also very shouty and angry about everything. And really wants that damn sword. Too bad. Pick an ore. See you later, losers. Pretty much. Um, and yeah, so we also get to see the guy who makes the sword, who, go figure, only travels by daylight because you don't want demons getting anywhere near that guy. And yeah, he wears a creepy-ass clown mask that's better than Western clowns, but still a clown. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that face was uh, something else. Visual bits on an audio podcast. I do like the... Uh... The kind of fake out there where the swordsmith is building up to, oh, you ha- you're a redheaded child of a family that works with fire. I bet you're going to have the super special red sword that marks you as super special special dude. And then he draws the blade and it turns black. Yeah, because apparently this super special metal that can absorb sunlight, which makes sense as to why it's the only type of sword that can kill a demon because we've seen what sunlight does to them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Apparently the color matters. And his turned black. Which no one knows much about for reasons that get explained in the next episode. But really, theoretically speaking, just going into color spectrum, if the whole point of the sword is to absorb sunlight, then wouldn't the black sword be the best one because black will absorb the most wavelengths? It depends on whether you're going uh, pigment or light. Because light, black is the absence of color, and in pigment, black is the presence of all color. We color theory in an anime. I mean, if we're going by, like, let's see, if we're going by, if we're going by absorption, I would guess we're talking about pigment. But that's just me guessing, rather than actually having any concrete evidence one way or another. Um, But yeah, I wonder what color sword totally not a demon hunter dad had. Yeah, dad. Dead. Since we do know, like, because I know it was mentioned on this show that he's probably not, um, you know, somebody mentioned, oh, yeah, he's probably not his dad's biological son, except they actually showed a little bit of the dad, slightly more of the side of his face than normal. And Tanjiro's definitely got dad's hair color and hairstyle. So he's definitely biologically a member of that family. And his earrings. Yeah. Hair color, hairstyle, earrings, affinity for fire, even though he uses water. Um, And at the end of the episode, he finally gets his first mission. Girls have been going missing. Get your ass out there and find the cause. I also like how, I guess if you're lower ranked, you don't get to use your own birds to send messages because that bird just shows up. Like, it's his bird, so so far as we know, it's implied to be his bird anyway. Shows up, gives him his mission, and then fucks off to nowhere. As a bird is prone to doing. Like, no ask, you know, no sending a message asking for intel on the town, what have you. Just go here. Okay, bye. Whatever. Pretty much. And that leaves us to episode six, Swordsman Accompanying a Demon. Um, Nezuko has a box now. It's a, it's a good box. 
It's a very lightweight box, and apparently she can shrink herself really small. Because apparently, sometimes you do put baby back in the box, <laughs> in the corner, with the bunny. I just wonder, if that thing is that airtight that it blocks out all light, does she need to breathe as a demon? Because it doesn't seem like it's very well ventilated. Yeah, it, it's difficult to say, but yeah... Orokodaki was very specific about the fact of that they used a very lightweight wood and then used rock lacquer to make it extra durable. I don't know what rock lacquer is, but apparently I want it on everything that's made of wood. Apparently. Also, that guy is real good at a lot of shit, but that's what happens when you've been around since the Edo period and it's now the Taisho era. Yep. He, uh, he'd been around a bit. A little bit. So we finally get to the town. We get to see Tanjiro in his Demon Slayer uniform, finally, because we've seen him in the opening and the ending wearing this since the very beginning. And he finally gets to dress up in it, head out. We learn that it's got some pretty neat properties. Weaker demons can't tear it. So slightly protective, can't get gnawed on quite as easily. (laughs) And off to the town where this poor kid whose girlfriend vanished right from, from right beside him, is wandering around like a zombie. He's seen some shit. Or rather, hasn't seen some shit. Yeah, both. Um, and her family totally beat the shit out of him for losing her. Assholes! I mean, okay, to be fair, if it were your daughter, and she went on a date with a boy, or anybody really, but they're a straight couple, so we're going to stick with that. Um, she went on a date, The kid comes back without her and says, sorry, she vanished from right next to me. Well, where the fuck is she? Exactly. Like, CJ, I don't know if you want to weigh in from a chair, but can you imagine if some asshole teenager came home without Kiara? What would you do? Uh, That kid's not going to go very far very fast. Yeah. He might might go pretty far depending on how late he is. And I'm a pacifist. (laughs) So, yeah understandable reaction like sucks to be that kid but also if i were that daughter's parents i cannot say that i would not do the same thing um but hey it gives us a witness it gives us a lead for tanjiro who picks it up and immediately starts smelling the ground in front of this kid and then in front of the rest of the town because why not let's just smell the ground which of course we know what he's doing but i like watching the images of all the random people in the background like just kind of freaking out as to what he's doing but it gives him a good lead and the kid is actually pretty smart like he sees tanjiro putting together clues and realizes hey wait a second i think i know who this guy is and what he's about um and yeah and that leads us to the awesome fight scene we got oh boy the fight choreography in this is real good guys yeah, it is. Holy crap. Watching him spin and jump and dodge out of the way was really fucking cool. Primarily based on sense of smell. Yeah. Yeah, because he can't see them. They're in the fucking shadow realm. And so he d- has no idea where they're going to come out from and has to rely on the sense of smell that he honed on Urokodaki's death mountain. Watch out for the falling boulders. I mean... Maybe try equipping a metal shield. Nah, turtling won't do you any good. They come out of the ground like fucking Mr. Fucking Shadowhand. Oh, man. So, yeah, we we find the the culprit here, except it's not just one culprit, but apparently is the same culprit, because somehow or another, this particular demon managed to split itself into three. Probably those shadow arts that Urokodaki was talking about. Quite possibly, but it's, it's a very interesting set of divisions, because... Of the two that have vocalized much at all, you have two very different personality aspects. I mean, three, because you've got the more in-control one, you've got the fiery, impatient hothead, and then you've got Grindy McTeethface. Grindy McTeethface. Uh, That sound. Yeah, that reminds me of like a Pokemon using Screech or something, to be perfectly honest. Probably. Would not surprise me. But yeah. This th- this one demon is now three demons, marked by the number of horns on their heads, because Japan, why the fuck not? It makes sense. And they can all do this ridiculous shadow merge thing of ultimate ridiculousness. And Tanjiro's having a little bit of a hard time fighting these guys solo. Go figure. And it's- then, 
out of nowhere, a boot to the head. Straight out of the door. Which, again, brings us back to the point of whatever this rock lacquer stuff is, I want it on everything. Because if it can stand up to the force of a demon kicking it open. Mm-hmm. Straight out of Boxton. Yes. Straight out of Boxton. And great little bit of slight comedic timing, but also showing that this demon is stronger than the first one they fought. This demon's head did not go flying when Nezuko kicked it. It spun around like goddamn Beetlejuice. Several times. <laughs> To several the, full rotations to the point that it when he unraveled it he like had to spin it around a bunch and you just kind of sit there watching like okay how long is this gonna last um and it turns out that urokodaki for all he was super hard on tanjiro and rightfully so for walking around with a demon um decided to help them out a little bit to help not only tanjiro but to help nezuko as well by using hypnotic suggestion on her all humans are your family. Protect humans. Never forgive a demon who hurts humans. All demons are the enemy. I got that out of order, but whatever. I mean, it's it, it's the same regardless of the order you put it in. But this is not only fantastic because it means we're probably going to at least quasi-regularly see Box Sister action, which, fantastic. It, it, it's nice that she's not just damsel in distress fodder. Yeah. But the fact that this is probably going to bite them in the ass at some point. Probably. And it'll be interesting to see how the series handles it when it does. Yep. Though at least she hasn't fought her uh, bamboo pacifier so far. Right. Oh, the bamboo pacifier. We also learned something else important this episode. What's that? Apparently, there's only one demon out there that can turn other people into demons with its blood. Yep. The, and that's uh... the first demon. Michael Jackson. I mean... I mean, he's very into a certain aesthetic. Um, we've been seeing him in the opening for quite some time now. It's, yeah, it's the Michael Jackson looking motherfucker. There we go. Actually, unmute when I tell you to unmute. That'd be fantastic. Uh, yeah, apparently, despite the fact that this is a, a thousand year old demon, he likes to wander around in suits in a fedora. Sure. Maybe, I'm not going to knock the fashion sense. Maybe he can time travel. I mean, so this is World War One era. I'm not sure when fedoras and trilbies came into fashion, but suits are around, just not really in Japan. So depending on how worldly this demon is, or if he's been to the parts of Japan that are currently trading with the outside world, he would have seen suits at some point. Because even, even Tanjiro's Demon Slayer uniform... Even though we associate that high collar style with Japanese high school boys uniforms, that was originally based on Western military uniforms. So even his uniform is westernized, just less so. Yeah, it's it's just even though we've seen like the power lines and everything around, it, it creates an interesting dichotomy of here's your potential big bad of the series, the first demon from over a thousand years ago. In his smartly tailored suit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but that you do see that a lot in anime where the bad guys have all the shiny new stuff. And the good guys are the scrappy underdogs, the old school, the traditionalists. And especially in this time period in Japan where the West was a relatively new thing and not everything coming from the West was a good thing. Because, yeah, the West brought electricity and clocks and shit. They also brought opium and guns. And we can do that in Rurouni Kenshin. <laughs> yeah, we do. So, yeah, Westernization is a very complicated subject. And that has always been Japan in modern pop culture is the land of old and new. So it's an interesting dichotomy to see it portrayed that way. Side note. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to agree with your statement, but go ahead with your side note. Uh, side note, I really want to see when they when they pose as a team, because shit just got real. Because we know from the ending, it's going to happen eventually. I, I'm still upset that we are, what, now six episodes in, and we haven't seen more than opening ending glimpses of Boarhead Man. I want Boarhead Man in my life already. I want to get to know uh, not Kaminari more. Yeah, the, the lightning kid. Yeah, lightning sparrow. And Butter Butterfly Girl seems pretty interesting in in the fact that she did 
fuck all of nothing at the rock picking ceremony. She was just kind of there with her butterfly and completely spaced out. Yeah. Hopefully she is not token girl fodder. No, she's, she's probably the token. Oh God. She's actually taking things seriously run. (laughs) Cause keep in mind she survived. Yeah. That hasn't stopped other mangaka from taking previously strong characters and turning them into token girl fodder though. So this is true, but there's always been more of a <laughs> Star exorcists. Sorry, go continue but what you're saying. Like you had some bullshit cut in your throat there. It's okay. It happens. Uh yeah, I mean l- literally we know less about her than anyone else who survived that selection process. So, <laughs> cuz at least we know yellow-haired kid is an import, some foreigner's son and apparently super paranoid about things and obviously going to have lightning powers based on his opening bits. Some kind of rivalry situation with Boarhead Kid, which, again, win and need Boarhead Kid in my life. And then you got Shouty McShoutface, who is shouty and angry about everything, but he wants his sword. So yeah, uh, her, we know nothing about other than she apparently likes butterflies. Yep. So we'll see what happens. Indeed. Oh yeah, and Tanjiro's black sword apparently means that he likely won't get too far. So we'll see. Supposedly. Um... So yeah, we have, uh, I think we should probably move on to the next, on the list of fruits basket. Getting fruity with the basket. I'm curious to see how you're enjoying it so far, because I know that the beginning of it wasn't really your cup of tea. This show is just, it's not generally my thing. I, I don't go for the super sappy, romantic, ridiculous, sparkle explosions. But when the completely ridiculous bullshit out of left field stuff happens, like for whatever random reason, the stick figure show you can on the roof. Yes. There was no reason whatsoever for it to be a pair of stick figures. Everything else in that scene was perfectly animated just fine. The fact that they decided to go with stick figures. Sure. That made me chuckle. I appreciated it. The two best characters in this series are still the two best friends. They are amazing. I I don't care. I will watch it for them. Yeah. And honestly, like, it is, it is sappy as fuck. It is an absolutely ridiculous premise. The protagonist is pretty much too good of a person to actually exist. But I am so hardcore nostalgic for this show because my aunt and I read the manga together as the volumes were coming out. And there is some legitimately good characterization in this show. Once it actually starts going, yeah, it still has the shoujo manga corniness. But there is stuff to love in here. And I'm glad that you're not actively hating it because that would make me sad. I mean, there are people I hate in the show. Yeah. Oh, and you're going to hate them even more when you get to some of the stuff the original anime didn't cover. Yeah, I can't wait. But yeah, I'm I'm not crazy about the fangirl club because fuck those bitches. I'm not crazy about Bunny Boy because borderline trap character. Yeah, he was tolerable in the he was he was okay tolerable in the manga at the beginning and then likable as he grew as a person. Primarily because with the hyper like the hyperactive like super super overly cute characters, I tend to not like them in anime because their voices annoy me. Like just that vocal stereotype annoys me which is ironic given that i'm playing one on exploding dice but whatever (laughs) um but yeah but there is legitimate growth there um the prince yuki fan club they exist to be butt monkeys at least they are not supposed to be taken seriously (laughs) player let god sort them out i mean no see what you do what you do is you get toru onto another continent and then tell them that she lives with him and just and watch them. Watch them all drown in the ocean trying to get to her. I don't know. Watch them self detonate. <laughs> oh, it'd be like that scene from The Kingsman. Yeah, they just. Their <laughs> brains, da, 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 da. They just can't handle it, though. Okay, that was. That would have been a good nickname. <laughs> I just live with him. <laughs> uh huh. Fuck her immediate family. Yeah. Toru's family. So yeah, and I'm fooling myself. We should probably actually talk about the stuff that happened this episode. Um, Toru's grandfather's renovations are quote unquote done, 
which means they're not done at all. The interior of the house is finished, but they're still working on the outside. So it's going to be noisy and messy as fuck, yet you need to come back and live with us now for whatever reason. Um, so she moves back. She leaves her grandpa's address with Shigure and the boys and moves back because that's what she was told to do. She does what she's told. And we get to meet her father's family. This is her this is her dad's father and dad's either sister or sister-in-law and her kids who are there in the house right now. Um teenage daughter, teenage cousin is okay. Like she's probably the least offensive of the younger generation. She's not great, but she's at least pretending to get along somewhat. Um teenage cousin male is a little shit who decides to be a fucking perv about everything their mother is a piece of garbage who insinuates all kinds of horrible things about toru and the somas and basically gives her the get in line speech until grandpa slaps the ever-loving shit out of her i love grandpa grandpa has dementia he keeps calling toru kyoko which is her mother's name he keeps mistaking her for his daughter-in-law because he thinks that that is the age that everyone should be at. Spoiler alert, Toru's mom married into the family really young. Um, he doesn't understand that this is his granddaughter. He thinks that this is his daughter-in-law. And he still gives her the, my family are a bunch of little shits. I choose to love them anyway, but you don't have to put up with this. If you would be rather be somewhere else, go. And then we flash backwards a little bit to Kyo and Yuki having an angst off in Shigure's living room. Extreme angst off. Jesus Christ. Because as you may have been able to surmise from the flashbacks that we've seen so far, neither Yuki nor Kyo had very healthy upbringings. They were both stifled and suppressed as children for various reasons, and therefore neither one of them knows how to comprehend compute verbalize or in any way shape or form express or handle these strange human sensations known as emotions having feelings is a completely foreign concept to them and so they don't know how to just say i miss her or hey how how do you feel about this hey we should go get her Instead, Yuki just decides, I'm going on a walk, grabs the paper, and leaves. Kyo decides, hey, I'm going on a walk. Fuck, where'd that paper go? Bitch boy took it. I mean. And we start to see Shigure meddling a little bit more with poking them towards her. Um, because that's what Shigure does. He is a shit stirrer to the nth degree. He is... Yeah! That agent of chaos. Yeah, oh yeah. Orochimaru likes to watch the windmills. Shigure likes to grab the windmill propeller and spin it as hard as he can, like the fucking Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> big money, big money, big money! I mean, that's him! You're not wrong. And so they finally catch up to each other. We actually get to see the first time that Yuki and Kyo, number one, agree on something, which is that Toru needs to come back. And number two, cooperate on something, which is getting her back. These two boys who have been raised, and they are the same age, they have been raised constantly comparing each other, themselves to each other, raised to consider each other enemies, pretty much, because of the Zodiac politics. And they finally find something more important. Something more important than their bullshit war. Girls. I mean a friend. But when is she going to fly off and be a good dragon... Oh, you'll meet the dragon. Um, I mean... Anyways. And yeah, they finally get to the house. And instead of, like, normal people knocking on the door, they decide to creep around to the back of the house and listen in at the window until they find the perfect moment, which is Toru finally giving in to the you don't have to put up with this shit, admitting she wants to come home, and then they burst in through the window like the fucking Kool-Aid man, except Japanese style because they opened the window instead of breaking it. Well, no, Yuki just lets himself in. Kyo's the one who almost Kool-Aid mans through the door. He almost Kool-Aid mans in through the window, but Yuki opens it first. 
before they get to that point. And then they get to make their shoujo manga her- hero entrance with the, I want to go home, then let's go home. Which is corny as fuck, but I love that about shoujo manga. You know, as much as, you know, we love the big epic moments in shonen bullshit, right? The power of friendship, United States of Smash, you know, Kirishima reaching out his hand and Bakugo taking it. This is that for shoujo manga. Happy fluffy ice cream fun time. And yes, it takes a different form, but for those who like it, it's just as fun. Understandable. And yes, we know it is cheesy and ridiculous and over the top, and we like it that way. Shoujo moe bullshit indeed, CJ. Yes, that's exactly what it is. And that's why shoujo fans watch slash read shoujo. We know, we know it is ridiculous. That is the point. It's all about that fantasy, yo. Um, And so they finally get to go home. And then the next episode comes along where Uo and Hana finally realize slash learn because Toru lets slip that uh, she's been living with a bunch of boys. <laughs> Oh my. It was never explained in the anime why Hana was wearing the uh, the witch outfit during the onigiri stand. I'm pretty sure she was doing some kind of fortune reading thing with her waves. I mean, let's be fair, she doesn't need a reason. She doesn't need a reason, but I think that I think she actually did have a reason for wearing that. Um, but she is beautiful the way she is. I do love her super fancy long ass black ruffly nightgown that she wears. Because, spoiler alert, we should invite ourselves over, but not immediately. Go to the next day, because otherwise they're not going to have snacks ready. But no, we need to strike while the iron is hot, otherwise we'll miss our opportunity. Toru, we're spending the night! And, yeah, very odd sequence of scenes unfold, because it's practically like a sort of lesbian mom duo. A little bit, a little bit. Um, so for a while... Don't hurt our precious baby girl, but you guys are okay, so we'll let her stay with you. Pretty much. I mean, so this is kind of the beginning of Yuki and Kyo learning how to make friends. Because Toru doesn't count. Toru is family. Toru is love. Toru is life, according to them. Um, but here's just these random-ass girls that invite themselves over to their house, and suddenly they have to coexist with them. And you get to see a little bit more about their personalities, because they're wearing their normal their normal clothes coming in at no one's surprise hana is goth as fuck and uo is a yankee she that was a yankee coat she was wearing and she coordinated her nails with of which course was a she nice did touch. oh fucking course she did um and bleaches her hair that is that is canon that is not anime hair bullshit her hair is blonde because she bleaches it because again yankee and she gets into a fight with Catboy over it because <laughs> yep. What bottle do you get hair color from? This is my natural hair color, bitch. And she does not, she slash, she either does not believe him, is super jealous of him, or both. Because, yeah. Yes. The answer is yes. Again, with the shoujo, uh, or the anime hair bullshit, Yo's hair is fucking orange. It is orange tabby orange. Go figure. He's the cat. Yeah. To the point that she even calls him carrot. You know, like, kakarot. No, no, Bro- Broly, calm down. Calm down. <laughs> D- wrong Broly, that's the good Broly. Best Broly boy. He he is the goodest boy. And yeah, so Shigure being Shigure gets a call, has to leave, I, or gets a call, air quotes for audio listeners, has to leave, and leaves the kids to their own devices. And surprisingly, so we get to see some character growth here, because Yuki and Kyo don't break his house. <laughs> they are left unsupervised. And from the TV to the shoji screens, nothing has to get replaced. Nobody dies. And they get to play Rich Man, Poor Man, which was promised in the previous episode, which is some kind of Uno-like card game, I think. I'm not really sure on the rules of it, but the point is to get rid of all your cards, basically. Yeah, Rich Man Payoff, exactly. Um, And we get to see a little bit of Shigure's soft side, because he went out and bought the most princess-tastic fucking fluffy monstrosity of a bed that he could possibly find for Toru. Big enough to fit three people comfortably in it. That was probably a king-size bed. Because their precious little snowflake deserves every penny of it! Pretty much. Or I mean, something. they call him a, a doting grandfather in the in the sequence where they're seeing her room for the first time, and that's pretty much it. 
Shigure, in many ways, is simultaneously an old man and a young man in a young man's body. He got that dad soul. Oh, yeah. Again, dog. He's I like you. Boy. I fetched you the thing with my money. I mean, that is generally how you fetch things. You acquire them with currency. And yeah, for anybody who was thinking that Shigure is living on his own off of the Soma fortune, nope, that is his money. He's a novelist. He is a novelist. Both varieties. Yep. <laughs> I wrote this one for fun. <laughs> Which is funny because um, for anybody who watches One Punch Man, our next show, uh, where he begins, you know, I'm a hero for fun, shumide, so on and so forth. It's the same, the same grammatical structure that he, I'm just a guy who's a novelist for fun. I, I just like that she's, goth girl spends the rest of the evening reading the smut mag. Right. Like, doesn't care about the actual, you know, real writing that he's done. It's a, let's see what kind of, let's see what kind of trash he writes. Yeah spends the rest of the evening with it i mean not that i would know but i would assume that having access to someone's smut collection gives you a very deep look into their soul check that google history yo (laughs) or don't or ask communication is good people definitely ask yeah communication is definitely key as we see in this series (laughs) oh yeah and we got to meet a couple of new people we got to meet momiji the rabbit who is all kinds of, uh... He's a character who exists. Agent of Chaos Jellybean. Yep, pretty much. He is half German, half Japanese, because that is an oddly specific trope that keeps happening in anime. Um, He's and, a Nazi baby. And we get to see Hattori, who is the Soma's eraser. Not that kind of eraser. The Hippocratic Oath is a thing, but he is definitely the one who suppresses memories. So Yuki, understandably, does not want Toru anywhere near him because he doesn't want her losing her memories. And then guess what happens? He gives her a phone call and a summons to, and a instruction to tell no one. Yuki, who spent the better part of the episode in a dress because the female seniors forced him to. Can we talk about how fucked that up that is? Yep, and he just fucking does it. Which, I mean, hey... Props to Yuki for basically coming out and saying, yeah, I'm secure enough in my masculinity that I'll wear this stupid thing. It's no big deal. But yeah, that is super fucked up that they basically, I mean, this is- him into wearing a dress. Yeah, this is everything I stand against happening to female characters. And it happened to him. It's not cool either way you slice it, but at least it was only half the episode. Yeah, it's only half the episode. And- at, he did He did make it work in his favor by actually managing to somehow turn it into a compliment for Toru. Yeah, that was great, watching her brain completely blue screen there. Um, <laughs> Toru, that EXE stopped working. Pretty much. I did love his ability. And that's the thing is, like, it absolutely sucks that he was made to do that. And it is not okay that they made him do that. Don't do that to people, no matter their gender. Um do not force them into something they do not want to wear for your own amusement. Um, But the fact that he is a secure enough as a man to wear a pink frilly dress and Mary Jane shoes and not be bothered too much about it other than that you don't like the dress. Um, And two, to be willing to use himself as a distraction for his family to keep the secret from getting out. Also knowing people well enough to know exactly what buttons to push to get that reaction was pretty great. And we get to see a little more personality from him because as we're, as we've seen over the past few episodes, he really doesn't want to be an ice King. He just doesn't know how to be anything else. That's what happens when you don't let someone socialize. Yep. They don't know how. And we're starting to see that shell crack a little bit. And that part of it was good at least. And yeah. So moving on to, uh, is, is there anything else that we have other than this one? Mm, no, I mean, uh, that that's pretty much everything, and there's little tiny things that were missed out, like the expo- the the quarter explanation of what the fruits basket game actually was, and where the manga draws its name from. But yeah, the so how oh, because that was explained. I think they actually explained in a sidebar in the manga, like the actual rules to the game, where everybody is assigned a fruit, and then they have to call the fruit, and they run across the room or something. It's like like Red Rover, basically. Yeah, and the kids picking on Toru gave her the nickname Onigiri and never called it. 
which as the kid who always p- was picked last in school, that cut right to the bone. Yeah. We know that feel. Cause yeah, it, it, it was touched on at the end of the previous episode when she was going home with her boys that, you know, Oh, Hey, they finally called the rice ball. Yep. Or the jelly donut. Let's no. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have something against Brock's delicious jelly donuts? They may be triangular shaped, but they're the best jelly donuts around. Sure, if jelly donuts are made out of rice and mochi. That would have been a very good Ryan Reynolds joke for Detective Pikachu, actually. That really would have been. That would have been great. Hold on to no degree. Want a, want a donut? Uh, as if people think that American kids can't handle asking what a rice ball is. Um, right. Anyway, so yeah, good stuff. Even better stuff coming up. Um, and yeah, moving on to a One Punch Man. I love Kinzoku Bat. He's a good boy. I wish they would stop literally translating the hero names when their Japanese names are actually shown on placards on screen. That's a bit disorienting. Like, in the opening, you get Team Fubuki, and then in the actual anime, they talk about Lady Blizzard or whatever. Hellish Blizzard. Hellish Blizzard. Yeah, like, just, just fucking call her Fubuki. It's fine. <laughs> um, But yeah, Kinzoku Bet is awesome. After seeing so many of the A... As class heroes played for jokes and seeing them be kind of butt monkeys, it was really nice to see a high ranking hero who is both A, genuinely devoted to hero work, and B, real goddamn good at it. Also, gotta love that. Gotta love that rebel look with his pompadour and his big wide trousers. Yep. Got that bancho look going on. All that was missing was the hat. Maybe the, uh, sprig the big old banner yeah 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 it was so still, good still no powers yet says cj unless you count bat god as a power um his fighting spirit was very zenkai boost ish yeah pretty much i mean the, the 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 fact that he pretty much just refused to go down and just the fa- sheer force of will and the fact that garo could actually sense his power his power level rising as he took more of a beating like it might not be a god tier superpower but when i was watching it it honestly made me suspect that he's got a little something something going on other than sheer sheer physical strength like yeah it's probably a low level quirk but it served him extremely fucking well and he's also a good guy he really is like here are these excuses for human beings absolute shit stains don't put your plate back on the conveyor belt they need to tally it up it's rude to put your to not return your plate quit returning the fucking plate i swear to god if they return one more fucking plate i'm killing them both and then his little sister calls that was so cute and choose him out for working when he promised he'd take her shopping i totally thought she was like a teenager during this part of the show and then as we see later nope she's small and probably much more powerful than he is. Given that she knocked him out, I would say so. Um, but yeah, even though he is pissed at having to be there, not enjoying having to be guard duty while they get sushi when he could be fighting monsters, he still goes all out to protect them. Because that's what a hero does. A hero protects people. He still puts their safety first when the two uh, other heroes show up to back him up. His first response is, take these two and get out of here. Yeah, that's some, uh, that's some radiant behavior right there. Yep, and we get the, uh, the hierarchy of centipedes going on here. <laughs> Senti-kohai, Senti-senpai, and Senti-choro. Choro, which I'm guessing is boss. Um, and yeah, shit's not going okay because suddenly there's a threat level dragon and holy shit, the animation of that centipede was so fucking cool. Like, it did look like a dragon spiraling over the city, except it's a giant centipede with a weird-ass face. Several, actually. <clears throat> yeah, but the one face was super cool looking, because it kind of looked like an Ava unit on a centipede, and then it had like the weird, wrinkly old guy face that was kind of like a raisin. Yeah. <clears throat> but apparently it's weak point. Well, I mean, everything else is armor-plated. Yeah. Which, by the way, you know, all you sci-fi and fantasy authors out there, exoskeletons don't work on that scale. Clearly it's just being powered by magic. Or maybe its quirk is supporting itself. It's a possibility, but yeah. 
For anyone who's ever seen a movie or read a book or anything of that nature that featured giant bugs, don't worry, exoskeletons can't support something that size. An ant the size of a building would die because it would crush its own internal organs with the weight of its exoskeleton. So it's going to be okay. Didn't we used to have, like, giant-ass bugs back when conditions on Earth were different? Yes, because the atmospheric conditions were different. Yeah, because it was like there was more oxygen or something. Something like that. But yeah, thankfully, we screwed that up. We'll I... never have to worry about giant insects again. I think that changed long before we were even well, yeah, around. I can't make the joke otherwise. Yeah. But anyways... So yeah, we get to uh, to see some other heroes kicking ass and Garo still being Garo, befriending that little kid. I, I really, something's got to be going on with him and little kids. Yeah, because he fucking stops when uh, when Kinzoku Bat's sister shows up. Yeah, he he, he could have easily just smacked her into pieces. Destroyed both off, of them. To finish off Kinzoku Bat. And he doesn't. This little kid, he could easily take the book from him. But he doesn't. He just comes to the park to chill out with him. They read the book together. Goes about his business. And th- this this guy who, you know, calls himself a monster wants to be the biggest, baddest monster out there. You know, not totally 300% irredeemable. Yeah, I mean, he remembers being that little kid who was super into monsters. And he might, in a way, still be that little kid. Because you do see some childlike traits from him. You know, his lack of patience with, okay, I'm done with this now. I'm leaving. Bye. Yeah, that's a possibility. It, it makes him a very interesting antagonist. Mm-hmm. And there, and well, and there are certain circumstances in which people stop developing emotionally and socially. You know, you see that with trauma victims, with people who have, you know, substance problems. You kind of get frozen in time. Mm-hmm. So maybe something happened to freeze his psychosocial development at a child level. That's a possibility. It'll be interesting to see where they take it. For sure. And it, I, I hope they do something with it because so far I'm not sold on him as a villain. Like, yeah, it's cool that he's powerful and stuff. And I did like him. I did like watching him get his ass like s- tangentially beat by Saitama just from being around there. Like, Chunk. That was fantastic. Um, but yeah, like so far he hasn't really been compelling as a villain and that's starting to change a little bit with the flashback of him as a little kid and the thing of him not wanting to hurt little kids, but the, this guy is the strongest ever so far has not been selling me because that's, that's Saitama's shtick. He pulls that off much better than anyone else. Yeah. Cause he doesn't give a shit about it. Exactly. And speaking of Saitama. Ah, he totally wouldn't steal your identity and enter the fighting competition he's an upstanding person oh moomin rider i'm waiting for that wig to go flying off by the way it's it's going to at some point it's it's not very well adhered he didn't pay a whole lot of money for it so no and he didn't buy any spirit gum or anything like come on at least stick it on i mean especially with as smooth as his head is exactly (laughs) there is nothing there for that thing to grab onto via friction exactly so yeah that's gonna go flying at some point um thankfully Charanko's former senpai is a moron. Sour face. And boy, is his face ever sour. Yeah. Re- real interesting cast of characters introduced in the second episode with this uh, uh, this this martial arts tournament, Super Fight 22, going on. Yeah. And hinted that Garo snuck into the competition last year and beat everyone up. While wearing a wolf head. Only the other guy was, so, you know. Who better to impersonate than the masked character? Yeah. And, yeah, we get some get some real, like you said, interesting people. We get a couple of heroes. We get uh, not duo Maxwell. Yeah. Suirian. Uh, Suiryu. Suiryu, yeah. Not duo Maxwell with his star buttons and... Ugh. And, of course, the girl fighter goes out first. I'm looking at you, Shonen Tropes. Yeah... That wasn't great. Um, I do like the one guy talking shit about Saitama and then just getting bitch slapped. <laughs> yeah, the, not even one punch, one bitch slap. And this discount sort of Zeon Shar wannabe. He was gonna he was gonna propose to his girlfriend after he won his first fight. Oh wait, it turns out his girlfriend didn't even show up. Safe. Poor guy. Right. I wonder if he's part of Rectus. 
But yeah, this is this tournament is going to go south at some point, probably because of the hordes of monsters that are rape rampaging everywhere. Yeah, they're um, acting real organized for some reason. Yeah, it's almost like they've got an or- association or something. A villain association? No, that's ridiculous. And yet here we are. By the way, some of those monster designs are real fucking cool. Like that geisha looking girl with the raiju the raijin array behind her with the starburst kanzashi that was so cool she was real neat um and stun baton roller skate boy didn't stand a fucking chance no he did not because the monsters are getting smarter now they're not just rampaging they're actually strategizing and yeah paying attention to power set matchups and it's not going so well for the heroes no it's really not people are kind of going down left and right being taken out strategically which means probably in the next few episodes we're going to be getting the sequence that happens in the opening of saitama just punching a fuck ton of monsters like you do it's interesting seeing the difference in the approach taken to unusual heroes because you have one punch man where a lot of the heroes are just plain stupid and i don't feel bad saying that because that is 100 percent intentional because the whole hero association is basically a satire of superhero stories. Mm -hmm. But then you have, you know, My Hero Academia, where one of the coolest characters is Best Genus. What's your power? I can manipulate fabric. That doesn't sound, oh god. Or Gang Orca, my my powers are whale. (laughs) All the powers inherent of whale. So it's interesting where you see, you know the stupid and outlandish and useless in One Punch Man and what you would think is stupid and outlandish in My Hero actually being the coolest. Yeah, like the the, the one guy they showed very briefly during One Punch Man just carrying around a giant fucking kendama. The fuck are you going to do with that, kid? And they, they've also, it, it's been kind of somewhat subtle in the background, but there's been a very interesting nuanced bit of information that's trickled out over the first season and now the second season a lot of these monsters wind up saying the same thing. When I was human, dot, 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 and then they get absolutely obliterated. So the vast majority of these things that, you know, are being classified as monsters were at one point in time people. Yep. You know, in in season one, we have Crablante. I ate too much seafood and I turned into this. Uh, in the first episode of season two, we had the the lizard guy. My love of reptiles turned me into this. The uh, the guy they were fighting in one of the most recent episodes. My anger and rage turned me into a monster. So most of these were people. So it really makes you wonder where the line is actually drawn between hero and monster. Uh, motivation, maybe? Motivation, yeah, mindset. Because that's the thing is Garo wants to be the monster. He wants to be the greatest monster of all time. And he's still human, despite how powerful he is. Mm-hmm. And then you and have... Sorry, go ahead. You have his, his, his former master, Bong, fighting a four-armed demon boxer thing. You know, I have to stop Garo before he becomes this. It's like, at, at what point is he going to transform into an actual monster, if it happens at all? Mm-hmm. And then you have Saitama, who just wanted to be a hero for fun... And his powers are pretty monstrous. I wonder if it comes down to a purity thing. Purity of heart, purity of intention. Maybe. Because Saitama doesn't give a shit about any of the politicking bullshit that goes on with the hero organization. He just wants to have fun and save people. And maybe get paid for it. That'd be nice. Um, Also, some of them might still be people because the one bird guy who offered... uh, monster totally stuck a hand from out of a costume yeah, that was absolutely a human hand that popped out of those feathers and his his, his beak didn't line up with oh, what yeah, he was saying yeah his beak just kind of opened and words came out oh my god it's evil big bird pretty much it's probably just some dude in a costume that can fly yeah well you know stranger things happen in this show but yeah um so far even with the change in studios haven't really noticed you know, a, a drop in the quality of the series. Like, some things are animated differently, but it's still a good show. Yeah. Which still, makes me happy. Indeed. Still not sold on the opening, though. The opening's fine once it gets to that second half. Yeah, but for half of an opening to... Nah. 
and especially from Jam Project. Jam Project should know better. They're goddamn Jam Project. It's in the name, Jam. Half of that song is not a jam. Yeah, the rest of it is. Yep. <sighs> so, yeah, looking forward to seeing what happens here. Indeed, we'll see what happens. <clears throat> so, yeah, that brings us down to the uh, the bottom rung. Indeed, Senko the Helpful Fox. So we decided to try this out um, on CJ's recommendation. Um, thinking, oh, it's like Dragon Maid. Okay, cool, let's try it out. Um, it's a show that exists. Starts out pretty cute. Poor, um, poor overworked salary man has to put up with a bunch of bullshit from his job and keeps getting weighed down by negativity. And Fox Goddess decides to come help him out a little bit. Shows up at his house, starts making him dinner. Uninvited. Uninvited. Just let herself in. Because, hey, trespassing is apparently okay when you're a god. I mean, they live by different rules. And the show kind of goes on in that vein. Her helping him out, making him dinner, running baths, cleaning the house, doing all of that stuff. Yeah, I want to like this show because the the base concept is dumb, fluffy, ridiculous fun. It, you know, pitches itself as being, you know, very lighthearted, whimsical, you know, filling that kind of Dragon Maid niche without quite hitting you as quickly or as easily with the Dragon Maid level feels, which, by the way, second season, please, yes, win, now, thank you. Um, But some of the stuff this show does just winds up hitting a real sour note with me. Yeah, the part that really got to me were the parts where He's touching her tail or her ears. And he asks, and she says yes, but she clearly doesn't want to say yes. And she pretty clearly doesn't enjoy him doing it. And the implications there are a little unpleasant, even though she's 900 years old. Or I think it was 900. And that's the other thing that makes me a little uncomfortable with the series, is in the first couple of episodes, the amount of focus of him internal monologuing it's okay she's a thousand years old it's okay she's a thousand years old like he's almost trying to rationalize an an attraction to a very clearly underage in shape and build level and maturity because he knows she's a hundred couple year old fox god or whatever and it's like it reminds me of the guy from one of the Bayverse Transformers movies, whichever was it last night? Yeah, last night. The guy who carries around the card about the Romeo and Juliet laws. It's like, if you need to carry around something like that, if you need to you know, sit there and repeat to yourself in your head, it's okay because she's legal. It's okay because she's legal. It's okay because she's legal. There's something kind of skeevy going on there, and it really doesn't sit well with me. Yeah, and like parts of this show are cute, but there's not a whole lot of momentum i guess like even though like dragon maid yeah it was just a cute comfy show like stuff still happened and this so far we're just kind of repeating you know the same domestic fantasy basically which i would you know just enjoy the pampering just enjoy the pampering just enjoy the pampering which i would be more okay with if it weren't for things like the uh tailgasm and her climbing into bed with him and the the thing that really really kind of Russell's my Jimmy's the most is the, the the post credit stuff. The sort of almost instructional level video, like the kind you'd find on certain video sharing websites on the internet. It just when something makes me consider whether or not I should be watching it in front of other people, it's not really something I enjoy watching at that point. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's it's the first person thing to so you can put yourself in that spot and have the fantasy of being cared for by a small fox child is what that is. You're supposed to be able to put yourself in his place and have her doting on you. And it's like I I don't really need that. I'm sorry. It just it it strikes all of the wrong chords. And CJ bringing up Toru forcing herself on Kobayashi. They're both portrayed clearly as adults. Toru enjoys being affectionate with Kobayashi, and Kobayashi, while she gets exasperated with Toru's attempts, she understands this is Toru attempting to show affection to me. And 
tries to direct that those attempts to other things you know maybe try doing this or okay i'll hold your hand it is very different from i don't want you to touch me but i'll let you touch me anyway yeah that was the that was the thing with toru and kobayashi was like the, the, the repeated gag with the tail meat you know toru kept trying to get her to eat the tail meat she did not want to eat the tail meat she eased off on trying to get to eat the tail meat, but still, I would really be okay if you ate the tail meat. It's fine, really. And also, Kobayashi says no, Toru makes her something else. She's disappointed, but she makes something else. And there's a thought here, and it's not wanting to emerge. Yeah, you, you get a lot of that sort of dubiousness with, with both of them is the thing. And again, with, with Dragon Maid where it got to bothering me was with um, Luca and her human. M- maybe don't continue shoving your tits at the underage boy. Just saying. But yeah, this, this show in particular, this, I feel like I'm watch some, I'm watching something that was not made for me. This show was made for lonely Japanese salary men slash neats who could be salary men if they left the house. Yeah, because while while, Co- while Dragon Maid was by no means flawless and innocent in its execution of some things, it still put a good level of balance between the less desirable moments and putting forward a good developing story, even across you know the first couple of episodes. Where as you know, three episodes into Senko, and it's like I, I really don't want to watch this. Yeah, uh, parts of it made me uncomfortable. When when there were good, cute parts, they were fine, but there wasn't enough there to to balance the scale, to make it feel like they were going to be able to handle the material well going forward, like there was going to be actual development. And so, yeah, it just gave it the three-episode try and just it's not clicking. And I mean, I'm I'm sure there are some people out there who think it's the best thing ever, and by all means, if if you're enjoying it, if it doesn't bother you, enjoy it. It's just not for us. Yeah. You know what's clicking for us, though? Quick side note before we wrap up. Holy fuck, S.H.I.E.L.D. heroes getting twisty. Real good. Real, real good. And that's coming from someone who generally does not like isekais. Yeah. Um, definitely wish we'd been talking about it on the show from the beginning, but I'm enjoying it very thoroughly. And we've still got a few episodes to go, so we'll have to see what happens there. Hopefully we'll get a second season of it, too. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, yeah, no, that, that, that's, that's fine. We can definitely agree to disagree. Um, if, if you aren't seeing any problem with it and it doesn't bother you, then by all means, enjoy the hell out of it. If it's a happy, fluffy, fun time show for you, I absolutely want to keep it that way for you. But yeah. I can't continue watching the series and having problems with it and not have that emerge in the show. And we're trying to be generally positive here outside of the outliers, like, you know, grand crest, which shat the bed or Junie Tyson, which was just overall terrible. I don't want to constantly have a, this is the show this season that we shit on in this show. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd rather cover things that we genuinely want to recommend to people to enjoy because while it's it while it's fun to occasionally watch some garbage, like things that just genuinely aren't good, like the room, I I don't want to put forth a recommendation for anything that is potentially triggering or you know. So if we can't you know give a good hey go watch this to a show, not really going to keep going on or force myself to give a positive review of it, you know. I give my honest opinion on things. My honest opinion is this show is not for me. If it's for you, great. Ignore every bad thing I've said about it. Enjoy it. Enjoy the things that make you happy. This does not make me happy. So for me, at least, this is the last episode I'm going to be talking about it on. Yeah. Um, if, if we find another show to replace, to fill this fourth slot going forward, that's fine. If we just talk about these remaining three shows this season, Okay. We'll talk about three shows. Yeah, because we can talk for talk about all three of those pretty pretty in depth. Um, I would be okay with talking about Shield Hero a little bit more going forward. Um, 
CJ mentioned being able to binge some of it. Yeah, the first few episodes are pretty rough. Uh, we almost stopped watching it the first couple episodes, uh, but I'm really glad we stuck with it. And the thing I like about it is it does handle some darker story elements without being DC dark and gritty. Yeah, 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 yeah. And you still got your moments of levity, like uh, Philo, Philo kicking Motoyasu in the balls several times. So good. So good. Um, we're getting Raul caught up on it as well, so that's always fun. And another quick aside from the pre-show, go see the Pikachu movie if you haven't already. It is actually good. Um, I actively good. I actively hated the premise of this movie when it was first announced. I thought it was stupid that it was a thing that exists. I thought it was going to be terrible. I am glad I was wrong. Extremely wrong. A lot of love and care and dedication to the source material. Yeah. This movie. We all, I'm sure, as anybody who's played the Pokemon games and likes escaping into fantasy worlds in the form of D&D, books, media, what have you, has done and imagined what it would be like to live in a Pokemon world, if you want to see that in live action, the Pikachu movie is for you. So yeah, um, I think that's going to about do it for this episode. Uh, thanks, you guys, for listening. Uh, if you want to reach out to us about a show that you think we should be watching, you can always hit us up at show at geek-io.net. Uh, you can reach out to us on the social medias at slash geek.io show. You can call us on the Geek Hotline, 727-489-4335, 727-489-5-GEEK. And again, you can support this stream and everything we do at geek-io.net uh, slash Patreon or patreon.com slash geek.io, whichever way you feel like typing in it, it'll get you there regardless. Um, and that would give you another avenue to access us at because you can leave messages there. Uh, Patreon connects to the Discord, which Discord, <laughs> bang Discord, add Discord, something or other. I'm very tired. Go. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. You can talk to us there, leave comments, suggestions, your opinions on the things we covered, whether you agree or disagree. We are all about discourse and actual conversation here. Um, the only bad opinion is saying that someone else's opinion doesn't matter or is invalid. You can agree to disagree. You can disagree with someone's opinion. You could agree with someone's opinion. Just don't try to tell them that their opinion is invalid, that it's wrong, that it's something that shouldn't exist out there because everybody's different. We all live different lives. We all see things differently. And let's be adults and talk about it instead of getting angry. There is far too much anger in the world. Let's put some love out there instead. So uh, for myself, for Gary, for Justin, who unfortunately was a little under the weather tonight and couldn't make it, for our uh, man in the chair there, CJ, for our former man in the chair, Raul, for everyone at the network. We love you guys. Be good to each other. Enjoy the things that make you happy. Bye-bye. And we'll catch you next time. Oyasuminasai. You have been listening to a Geek.io Media Network LLC production. Would you like to convert that to pounds? Copyright 2019. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>